This is Al French from Earth Healing. Uh, today we're going to be talking about hemp, a crop that was great in Kentucky from back 150, 200 years ago. It's going to come back, and we don't know how much or and in what fashion. But we're talking to an expert on this, Dr. David Williams from the University of Kentucky. And he's going to introduce us to this experimental place near Jackson, Kentucky and we will see the different varieties of hemp and other fiber crops that are being grown at this time. Dr. Thank you, Wood. thank you very much. So we are at the UK Robinson Center for Appalachian Resource Sustainability, also known as the UK R Cars, uh, historically known as the Robinson Station. So we are a part of the Kentucky Agricultural Experiment Station System. We are a substation within the large system across Kentucky. We're much smaller than other UK farms, uh, but we serve Eastern Kentucky and the Appalachian region specifically. And so behind me, you do see an industrial hemp variety trial that also includes canaf, which is hibiscus cannabis, uh, not the same species as industrial hemp, but also a very high yielding vast fiber plant. And so we're comparing canaf to industrial hemp uh, and several industrial hemp varieties within this trial. Uh, we have three planting dates for this trial, three planting locations uh, where we put the same trial at three locations on the 1st of May, the 1st of June, and the 1st of July. And by doing so, we can evaluate the effects of location on individual varieties and certainly the effects of planting date on the ultimate yields among the varieties. And that's what we're trying to accomplish with this work. Well, thank you. This is July 17th, and uh, you told me once that this is one of the fastest growing crops. Is that right? This was planted back in May? This was planted at the 1st of May, I think and exactly on the 2nd of May. It's getting ready to be over our head? Yes, yes. So this is a fiber trial, and actually we have some varieties that are ready to be harvested oh, uh, for right? fiber. The yes, ones the, that are very tall? The ones that are flowering. The ones that are flowering. We, we want to harvest fiber crops uh, at flowering. Uh, if we allow the plants to go to seed, uh, the fibers within the stalks become highly lignified. A lot of lignin is produced to increase the strength of the stem. Uh, as the seed matures, it prevents the plant from falling over. And lignin's great for that in nature, but it's horrible for fiber processing. So we don't want lignin when we're processing these long, fast fibers. So we're going to harvest these uh, these flowering varieties very soon. Maybe the public should know that the flowering is also very important in the uh, hemp area. Yeah. You absolutely. might want to talk about the CBDs maybe for a moment. And then clearly for grain as well. Uh, there grain is, as well. There's no grain without flowers. Yeah. And so uh, for a fiber-only crop, we're going to harvest at flowering. For a grain crop, we're going to harvest at full seed maturity, yeah. uh, which will be well into the fall for most varieties. Okay. And then for a CBD crop, there's lots of genetic variation among the varieties that are grown for CBD. So uh, maturity is a function mostly of day length. And so when that plant matures will be a function of where it was derived uh, and the latitude where it was derived, what the day length was. And there's a lot of variation within CBD production as to when that would occur by our calendar, whether it's August, September, October, or some earlier month. So you're telling our viewers that it is not just uh, one variety of hemp, there's a lot of varieties, depending on what you're doing and where you are. Yeah, at the very least dozens and probably hundreds. And that's what varieties. part of your work is. Yeah, so this is a very small uh, subset of different varieties, but if, if you do use the camera and pan a little bit, you can see that the, the one to my left, or your right, uh, is definitely flowering. It's a dioecious variety, so we're seeing the male flowers mostly, and you also note that the bees love the male flowers on hemp plants. Well, that's interesting. They love it. They absolutely love so it. So they make a honey? They do make honey, <laughs> yes. Now, that's not their only source of pollen. Yeah. Uh, you know, all these other plants, clovers and others on our station are, are flowering yeah. as well. But then if you turn to my right, you'll notice that this is also a dioecious line. In other words, we have male plants and female plants, uh, but we don't have flowering yet. 
So the difference is latitude from where these plants were derived, where these varieties came from. So the ones that are flowering are from Italy, and the ones that are not are from Asia. And the ones from Asia were derived from closer to the equator, and the ones from Italy were derived from a more northern latitude. So our days are already short enough to cause flowering in those lines, but not short enough yet to cause flowering in those lines. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, could you say a word about the canaf that's in between some of these? Or yes. People have not seen that either. Yes. Again, uh, canaf, the scientific name is hibiscus cannabinus. Yeah. Yes. And so it's it kind of not related directly to industrial hemp or cannabis sativa. Uh, but many people have noted that occasionally you get the palmate leaves uh, expressed in uh, some canat uh, plants and varieties. As a matter of fact, uh, well, if you can come over closer and take a look at this. There, there's one. So it looks a little bit like a hemp leaf, uh, but close observation. Is this, is this a canat? That is canat. And you My can, goodness, uh, it's been eaten by, uh, it looks like a Japanese beetles. That's correct. The Japanese beetles love it. Uh, <laughs> and fortunately, uh, they don't do enough damage to hurt the plant. Yeah, we've seen a lot, a great reduction in yield. Now today, it's much shorter than the hemp on either side. But ultimately, by the end of the growing season, it will be taller than the hemp on either side. So, uh, so far, uh, the canaf that we've evaluated has out-yielded all of the varieties of industrial hemp that we've evaluated. We can, we can derive six tons per acre dry matter uh, with most of the canaf varieties and we're probably closer to three to five tons per acre. Is that right? Yes. Now that's fully a function of variety and so there's no doubt that industrial hemp varieties exist today that will compete with that yield but we haven't had access to them yet to evaluate. Do you think that uh, canaf is going to be a competitor to hemp as far as the fibers go? Yeah, more than a competitor it will be a colleague uh, it will be another vast fiber plant. Because uh, it has yeah. other varieties. Exactly, of. yeah. So it will be used in applications perhaps different than uh, applications for hemp fibers. But we don't have to cut trees in order to get the... Uh, uh, yeah, the it's a summer cut. annual. Yeah, so, yeah, it's a summer annual plant. We uh, both uh, hemp and canap. Uh, we plant in the spring, we grow them during the summer, and we harvest in late summer, early fall. Yeah. So it's an annual cycle. Yeah. yeah. Just like corn. But it's far corn. easier to harvest uh, nowadays, maybe not in the old days, but nowadays, than uh, to actually cut pulp from our trees. Right. So today, uh, we would we would harvest these plants with typical hay equipment. Okay. So a sickle bar or, or disc type Cutting mower. close to the ground? Yes, cut it close to the ground. We lay it on the ground and ret the crop or rot the crop to a very precise point, and then we would rake the crop into, into rows and bale it. Okay. Yeah, for processing. You were telling me they hang it in the barns like they... Do? Not fiber. Not the fiber. Yeah, yeah they, the they, 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 some the people plant, might do the, that uh, for CBD. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. Maybe people uh, will realize that we do have hemp oil, but we also have uh, the CBDs, which are very uh, much used today in me medical practice. Well, that's probably a strong statement. They're, they're publicly available. Uh, it's not legal to make medical claims about CBD. Uh, it, uh, it's not an approved molecule by the FDA with one sole exception, and that's uh, Epidiolex is a FDA approved drug for use in treatment of severe seizure disorders in young children. For example, Dravet's syndrome. Uh, but that's its only approved uh, medical function. But that's uh, coming it, from hemp. That's coming from. Uh, that does come from, from industrial hemp. That's industrial correct. Industrial hemp. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, good. Wonderful. Well, you have a lot of varieties here, and you're looking uh, for uh, what is the beautiful one there? Is that that one's from Asia? That's yeah. from Asia. Yeah. My, they look different, though. I think they do. Yes. Yeah. They are very different. Yes. Yeah. Uh, European versus Asian. Uh, if the, around this, the other side of this trial, we have what we call a dual purpose variety trial, where we would grow the plants for the grain, for the seed they produce, for food, whether for humans or animals, and then subsequently we would harvest the stalks for their fiber. We've already noted that mature stalks are lower quality fiber than 
a fiber only crop would produce. But that's okay. There are applications for that lower quality fiber in the industry where a dual purpose uh, crop can fulfill that that need or that or that application. And so, well, tell me us again about uh, fiber itself. Now, why would people want this instead of a uh, synthetic fiber? That's a great question. And so, it depends on the application as to exactly why they would seek a natural fiber. But uh, the the answers are generally. Two, two reasons. Uh, number one, it's greener. It's a greener application, uh, uh, better recycling capacity than a uh, synthetic fiber would provide. And then often, not always, but often, natural fibers can be both lighter and stronger than synthetic fibers in some applications. That comes so, as a surprise. It us. does, yes. And because it's a. You it's, always think of nylon uh, or, uh, and uh, rayon as being very light weighted. Fibers, right? And right. they were replacing, and back there in the 30s, they were replacing uh, the, the hemp at that time. The natural fibers at that time. Yeah, at yes. that time. But yes. you're telling us there are new varieties of natural fibers that are going to get back into the business of being natural fiber production. That's the indication to date. Absolutely, exactly that. And we're very, very excited about that potential. Mm -hmm. uh, natural fibers. Uh, can be utilized in many, many different industries. Okay. And uh, we do have a large, fast fiber, industrial scale processing facility, the Sun Strand Company in Louisville, mm -hmm. uh, the only one in North America that's of an industrial capacity. And uh, they are investigating utilizations of natural fibers beyond our wildest thoughts. So uh, they're moving forward with selling those materials to uh, corporations all across the United States. And so their source, uh, those are the two or 3,000 acres of the past few years. A lot of that goes to this company? That's correct. They're buying it? That's okay. correct. Yes, they have contracted with farmers, usually in counties contiguous to Jefferson County. Yeah. And uh, the farmers are, are producing this raw material uh, for processing at their facility. Processing can range from light processing to quite heavy or in-depth processing, which produces almost a cotton-like material. Yeah, and so very, very different than, than what we generally think of when we uh, consider natural fibers. It uh, looks very, very much like cotton when it's highly processed. Well, we have to remember again that back in the 1800s, most of the uh, fiber was used for very coarse ropes, Canvas, uh, yeah, canvas, canvas for yes. sailing ships and yes, so forth. Yes, exactly. And when that. those sailing ships went down in number, yes. uh, the production decreased too. Well, it, actually what happened uh, when the sailing ship industry declined, uh, hemp fabrics were often used as bags for cotton. <laughs> so, no. yeah, so uh, one fiber type. Yes, uh, yes, exactly that. And yeah. so they were used for cotton bales, to, to uh, wrap okay. cotton bales okay. with, yes. I so, know you know, hemp kind of contributed to its own demise, in a way, uh, for, for the, the, rise, for of the rise of cotton as, as a natural fiber. I never thought of that. Yeah. Well, it's, like, it's got a very interesting history, doesn't it? It does uh, indeed. David. Yes. And uh, we ought to ask our viewers to look into it. Yes. Because it's very interesting. It is. It but is we are just introducing you to hemp. And so thank you very much for You're welcome. You said You're welcome. Issues. Yeah. We have seen an overview of the return of American hemp to our economy and to our world, and we're very happy about it. This is Al Fritz from EarthHealing.info. Please come and visit our site sometime. We'd love to have you.